So we've just begun urine formation. How do we actually make urine? We can kind of make urine in a variety of different concentrations depending on the um, status of the organism, right? So we have to be able to conserve water when we're dehydrating. We have to be able to over express water when we have too much water that's present. Uh, three different ways that we uh, produce and modify urine. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and secretion. We're going to begin with glomerular filtration. This is where we left off last time. So glomerular filtration is going to occur in the glomerular capsule. Interaction between the nephrons there, the glomerular capsule, and the glomerulus, which is the capillary supply for the glomerular capsule. And we start out filtering that protein free version of plasma. So, really, it's the plasma, which is all the water, the dissolved solutes, other metabolites, minus the proteins that are normally present, which are primarily going to be clotting proteins. And as that is produced, it's captured here in that glomerular space around the glomerular capsule or within the glomerular capsule. So we begin to capture this filtrate into that capsular space. The capillaries that make up the glomerulus, so those capillary cells in the capsule, they're actually going to be highly selective, which allows us to create this protein-free version of our plasma. We're going to just simply prevent those proteins from crossing into this capillary, I'm sorry, into this capsular filter. So these are highly selective, highly selective cells, only really going to allow water, H2O, and then small solutes, and small as in their size. So here in the nephron, the glomerular space, it's just water, which is a pretty small molecule, sodium, potassium, other very small metabolites. We're going to resist bringing in larger ions. So we're resistant to larger ions. And so what that means is we're bringing in small ions, we're resisting larger molecules, larger ions. And so if we compare the ion to water concentration versus the protein to cell concentration, the ion in that small molecule and that water concentration is going to be equal between the filtrate that's forming and the plasma. However, when we compare the protein and the cell content or concentration of the urine that's just being formed and then the bloodstream in the urine, it's much lower than in the plasma. So we leave these larger objects in place in the bloodstream and we pull out the smaller objects and the water. Now, when you look at two different compartments, so this is a capillary, and then over on this side we have our space, our capsular space. So we bring, so this is blood here, this is our space over on this side, our capsular space. 
we're going to allow water and other small ions to cross. So here I have water, H2O, and ions, small molecules. Out here, I also have water as this blood flows in through circulation. It comes in with water, with ions, with proteins, with cells. All of these objects, proteins and cells in particular, are much higher here. Really, the ion water concentration is going to be very similar. The protein in the cell concentration is much higher. Proteins and cells inside of a watery solution they create a pressure, okay? So it'd be kind of like if everybody's comfortable, right? What if I said, no, this is not happening. You all are sitting within these two, these two uh, columns or chairs. You all have to pack yourself in here. There's going to be a higher concentration of students in this space, more pressure because you're going to feel each other. Okay. So we have more protein and more cells here. This creates the, the, the inherent pressure in the blood to be higher than the pressure here. So what have I just done? I've created a high pressure area and a low pressure area. And we know that pressure is a force that moves a fluid. This is going to drive fluid in this direction. And then the selective nature of those cells prevents the proteins and the cells from crossing. So that's going to induce the drive, that pressure difference. Between the blood and the, uh, the filtrate, the urine that we're forming, is that driving force. For the filtration. Now, you also could argue that, well, there's also a lot of pressure in the blood because the heart is squeezing. The renal artery extends off of the aorta, which is not that far away from the heart. So we also are in a high-pressure environment in the blood because of the pumping of the heart as well. Okay? So both of those have this effect of driving water from a higher-pressure blood to a lower-pressure Filter. Blood flow itself uh, and, and this whole process is highly regulated. So when you're at rest, such as you are now, this is actually a really good time to be producing urine to help regulate the waste products that are in the bloodstream help to uh, filter the blood. So at rest, we have chemicals that are released that cause vasomotion. Vasomotion is movement of a vessel, and we're referring to the size of that vessel in terms of radius or diameter or circumference. So we're going to be able to change how open or how closed that vessel is. So at rest, we have lower effects on pressure from the heart. At rest, pressure in the heart is 110 over 7. Right? So your systolic pressure is 110. As you become more stressed, whether it's induced by exercise or some other stressor, blood pressure actually goes up. It tends to 180, 190, even in some cases 200. And so at rest, we have low pressure. When we have lower pressure, the change in pressure between two different locations partially dictates blood flow. So if we're at a low pressure, I'm going to have lower blood flow into the kidney. But I just told you that blood flow into the kidney would be optimal right now at rest because this is a great time to produce your great time for you to regulate your blood. So under that low pressure system, what we actually do 
is we increase vasoconstriction. So under our low pressure environment, we can increase, I'm sorry, not vasoconstriction, we can increase vasodilation and make our radius bigger. So the artery actually increases in size. And in that low pressure system, pressure is one of the driving forces for blood flow. Radius of the vessel is another important factor that drives blood flow. So by increasing the radius of that vessel, we can increase blood flow under those low pressure conditions at rest to maintain our filtration. During some sort of stress, uh, I'll use the example of exercise. So we're going to use exercise as a inducer of stress. What happens to the kidney during that stress of exercise? Exercise is not a great time to be producing urine. Stress is a terrible time to produce urine. And the reason it's a terrible time to produce urine is you don't want to waste the energy on urine production and, and, and functioning the kidneys if you're trying to get away from some stress. If you're being chased by a bear, it's better for all of that blood to be diverted to your skeletal muscle so you actually can run away from or fight off the bear rather than diverting any of that blood into the kidneys to generate urine. Then you don't need a pee. So during a stress like exercise or, or another stressor, the autonomic nervous system is going to inter interact with those afferent and efferent arterioles leading into that glomerulus. Now, during stress, I've already told you pressure is going to go up. Pressure is a driving force for blood flow. We actually want to reduce blood flow in this case. So pressure is going in the wrong direction. It's not really going in the wrong direction. It's actually going to help out to increase pressure or increase blood flow in organs where we need to have increased blood flow. But it's global because it's the circulatory system. So pressure goes up. What do I want to do to radius vessel? I want to include that radius vessel and shut blood flow away from the kidneys. So the afferent and efferent arterioles are going to be constricted. They're going to undergo vasoconstriction in this case. We can't completely eliminate blood flow to the kidney. I still need to maintain that organ in the basic life support, so to speak. So we're just simply going to knock off this portion of circulation, which is where we generate urine. We're still going to circulate some blood through the kidney as a whole to maintain this, the, the support of those cells. This has a net result of decreasing kidney blood flow. Kidney blood flow, not blood flow. That's supposed to be the bad. Okay, so kidney blood flow is decreased. And the compromise here of decreasing kidney blood flow allows us to increase that blood flow at our working organs, the organs that are helping to deal with that stress. Skeletal muscle, heart, things of that nature. Okay? So at rest, if I vasodilate by renal artery, I have a massive amount of blood flow that comes in. So I'm not affecting the efferent and the afferent. Large quantities of blood circulate through the glomerulus. And we have that pressure driving fluid and small ions into the capsular space. And we begin to generate that primordial or that first stage form of urine. 
then during stress, during exercise, I actually reduce, restrict blood flow through the cap, all of the different million or two million little glomerular capillary beds, still supply some blood into the kidney to give it basic life support, but I'm no longer producing urine at a very high rate at all. So if you ever have to go pee in the middle of a sporting event, especially endurance athletics, being a cross country runner, if you ever have to go pee, you're not running that. Sort of you got to induce a higher level of stress. So, once we created our filtrate, that filtrate begins to pass into the tubular system, into the proximal convoluted tubules. And we're going to undergo tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Now, with tubular reabsorption, we have a very concentrated form of urine that gets deposited into our tubular system. So the urine that's first formed, what I'm calling the filtrate, it's pretty concentrated. There's a high number of skull solutes that are dissolved inside of that solution. Some of that I'm going to have to recover, and some of the water I'm going to have to recover, depending on status of the organism. So that's what's initially drained into the convoluted tubules. We have this very concentrated form of urine. The, you'll remember, proximal convoluted tubules, they interact with a second capillary bed, right? Both the proximal and distal convoluted tubules are associated with those paratubular capillaries. So as that urine is drained from the glomerular capsule into the tubules, into the convoluted tubules, we're going to begin to interact with those paratubular capillaries that you can see here. So this is my concentrated urinary filtrate inside of the tubular system. These are the cells that make up that luminal wall of the nephron, and then we have that nearby paratubular capillary. And what you can see, depending on um, what's going on in the organism, we have different routes for water to cross back into the bloodstream. We have different routes for different solutes to cross back into the bloodstream. Okay, so we create a real concentrated urine, and then we begin to go through the process of modifying the blood in the capillary system, and also the tissue fluid that's surrounding the nephron. The, two, the fluid that's out here in this space between the cells and the bloodstream. Okay, so those proximal convoluted tubules are going to, the, really the both convoluted tubules, are going to interact with paratubular tubular, uh, paratubular capillaries. And those paratubular capillaries are going to modify the intracellular, uh, no, I'm sorry, the interstitial fluid, the fluid surrounding the tissue. So we're going to interact the different molecules here in the urine through the cells into the interstitial fluid. Some of that's going to be picked up here by the capillary. So we're going to be kind of keeping track of four different locations here. Urine, the cells, the interstitial fluid, and the capillary as we go through the process of now modifying this urine that's been formed. So the cells that make up the uh, the, the tubule, these folds here, do you remember what those are called? Those are called microvilli. The microvilli, what the microvilli allow is from this distance 
to this distance, the surface of that cell, to have a much greater surface area. If it did have these microvilli, these folds inside of the, uh, or on the surface of the cell that was just real flat and smooth here, it would be a much lower surface area. By putting these folds in, I increase the surface area. That means those cells now have a much greater capacity to interact with the urine that has just been formed. So this is increasing our surface area. That's what the SA stands for. When you look at this, if you look at that border, that uh, cellular border of the uh, proximal convoluted tubule under my microscopy, it looks very fuzzy. They call it a brush border. So that brush border, or those microvilli, are going to allow for a greater capacity of interaction between the urine, which has the water and the solutes in it. So if I need to move water and solutes out, I have very good surface of exchange that I can use in order to achieve that. So the cells of the tubule, one of the things that they're going to do here in the proximal tubule is going to transport a high amount of sodium. Now when I say sodium, in terms of the kidney, what I want you to think about is saltiness. Okay? So the urine, because it has a high concentration of sodium, is really salty. But what about over here in the interstitial fluid? If I move large quantities of sodium into the interstitial fluid, that interstitial fluid is also going to become much more salty. Okay? So the proximal convoluted tubule is actually going to actively transport sodium from that urinary filtrate into the interstitial fluid. That's going to make the kidney, not the bloodstream, but the kidney itself, more salty. So active transport of sodium from the tubule into the tissue of the kidney to make the kidney more salty. Okay, That's going to require ATP because it's an active transport mechanism. So I'm burning an ATP. So now part of the reason that I don't want to use uh, or produce urine rather when I'm exercising is because it's an energetically demanding process. I only want to do this when I have spare energy. So that sodium begins to be transported out, and it's initially transported to the inside of the cell. So it gets pulled in from the urinary filtrate through that luminal wall, through that luminal membrane, into the cell. Now, sodium, it has a positive charge, right? Because of its positive charge, it actually exerts some force. Another ion that's negatively charged, chloride, is actually going to follow sodium. So sodium has that positive charge, and as it crosses from one location to another, the chloride comes along. So I'm still using that mechanism, that active transport mechanism, to not only move the sodium actively across, but now I'm also passively pulling the chloride ion as well. This is supposed to be a plus side right here. So the chloride follows the positive charge of that sodium. Now, think about what's happening here. I've now taken sodium and I've taken chloride and I've moved it from here to here. Sodium and chloride are matter, that means they have mass, that means they take up space. I now have less sodium and less chloride here, so I have more room, more space. What do you think fills up that space? How about water? So by moving just sodium, actively transporting sodium across into the cell, the chloride comes with, I now open up space, and I have higher concentration of water here, 
Over on this side, by the way, I'm consuming space. I'm moving sodium and chloride in. That means less room for water. What have I just created? High water here, low concentration of water here. Concentration gradient. All from the act of transport of just sodium. Sodium gets actively transported across, costs an ATP, but I bring chloride with me, and I've now established a concentration gradient that favors the movement of water back into the kidney out of the urinary filter. So we create our concentration gradient for water. If those cells become permeable to water, which they actually are going to be permeable to water, you can see that water will go through the cell directly. It also will creep through these spaces in between the cells. So water begins to filter, filters through, in particular, a protein called an aquaporin to the intracellular fluid. <coughs> Excuse me. So we create a concentration gradient from the movement of the sodium for water to filter through these aquaporins into the intracellular fluid of the cell. Again, this is all just from the movement and active transport of sodium. We're going to do one more thing here as well. Because of that sodium movement, remember, sodium crossing the membrane creates this thing called current, because I'm moving a charged particle across the barrier. That's the definition of current. Currents can be used for work. So I can also capitalize on the fact that we have this sodium current that's being created, and that sodium movement provides some energy. So just by moving the sodium, we're, we're able to drastically change the compositional makeup of this urinary filtrate. In particular, I'm going to move things like glucose. I don't want to spend a whole heck of a lot of energy excreting glucose, do I? Glucose is a very important biochemical for, for, uh, for biology. I don't want to just give it back to the sanitary sewer. I want to make sure that I maintain my glucose because I'm going to need it for energy production. So any glucose that makes its way into that urine, we have a mechanism because of the sodium that that solute is pulled through, uh, pulled through the cell into the, the back into uh, the kidney tissue where it can be picked up by the bloodstream. Same thing for amino acids. I also can use this mechanism. It's a secondary active transport mechanism to deliver both glucose and those amino acids back into circulation. Okay, so really I have all of those different signals that are being moved because of the, of the sodium. And then I also have what? What is the tissue becoming? It's becoming salty. So I'm maintaining the saltiness of my kidney tissue. And that's going to, we're going to come back to that here in just a few minutes. So this solute here, this, I'm sorry, not solute, filtrate rather, that I've produced from glomerular filtration has now been radically modified through tubular reabsorption. Does everybody have everything we need here? So let's go take a look at our third and final mechanism to modify your tubular secretion. All right, so our tubular secretion is the idea that we're going to move. Tubular reabsorption is the idea of moving things out. Tubular secretion is the idea of moving things back into the urine.
Okay, so we're going to use this molecular movement back into the tubule. The capillaries, both the paratubular capillaries and then that capillary bed down here around the nephron loop called the vasorecta are going to be involved in this tubular secretion process. Those capillaries are going to secrete molecules. Now, those capillaries are going to secrete molecules based off of concentration gradients. So if I have much higher levels of sodium in my bloodstream than I do in my kidney, I have way too much sodium. And so this is going to be that mechanism where I have high sodium in the blood, lower sodium in the kidney, sodium is going to flush back into the kidney out of the bloodstream, reducing my sodium levels. And I do that for a variety of different ions. So the tubules will pick up those solutes that are secreted from the capillary back into the kidney tissue. The tubule picks it up. In addition to sodium, two of the most common that are secreted here through tubular secretion are the hydrogen, proton, and potassium. Both of these help to regulate things like ion balance and pH. So ion balance and pH can be modified here in tubular secretion. Okay? So tubular secretion is just this idea that we're going to have solutes that are going to come back into the filtration, uh, to the filtrate, to the urine that's being produced based off of their pervading concentration gradients with the bloodstream. So the last thing that I want to talk about here with the urinary system is I want to, we have a basic idea of how uh, the, the different solutes are being moved between the, the urine filtrate and then the, uh, the kidney itself and the bloodstream, right? So how do I actually use these mechanisms to generate urine that's really dilute me containing high amounts of water by using flush water and other um, ions, I'm going to want to create a pretty dilute urine. If I want to conserve water, I want to create a very concentrated urine. So really, we're talking about the really, really dark yellow urine, kind of like gray shirt today. You're, you're going to represent how the concentrated urine to a very light colored yellow. A very light colored yellow, almost clear, more like the, the almost the color of water with just a slight yellow change. Okay? How do we create those two different concentrations if you're concentrated to filter? Small concentration very well. So urine concentration. Remember I said that we are using our tubular reabsorption to make the kidneys sulfur. So that becomes very key here. You're going to see some numbers in here, and those numbers through the nephron and then through our circulation here are related to the concentration of the urine. <coughs> urine is more dilute when it's a lower number, closer to zero. It's more concentrated when it's a higher number. So it gets produced at a number 300. As you make your way through, especially this portion of the nephron here, the loop of Henle or the nephron loop, you can see that more and more sodium and chloride are moving out of the urine on one side, water is moving out of the urine on the other side. So as water moves out, remember up here what was going on? We had tubular reabsorption that was occurring. We we're making the whole kidney more salty. The whole kidney is more salty, water has a 
propensities to leave the urine to try to balance out that really, really salty kidney. So water begins to leave, but what happens is that urine becomes more and more concentrated. So then on the other side, we now have just created a less salty kidney, so sodium and chloride begin to move back out. And eventually we get over here to a point where we have very dilute urine. That dilute urine is great <laughs> if I want to produce dilute urine. But what if I don't want to produce dilute urine? What if I want to concentrate that dilute urine and I want to recapture that water into the kidney back into the bloodstream? I'm going to want to use some mechanism in here, we're going to get there in just a second, to bring a bunch of water back into the kidney. How do I bring water back into the kidney? I keep the kidney salty. Because if the kidney is salty, water rushes in to try to balance off that saltiness. So we're going to start on one side. I hope you don't mind. I need to so I'm going to start with our urine concentration, making our, we're basically going to deal with the book here. How do we make real dilute urine and get rid of excessive water, and then how do we make real concentrated urine and conserve water or keep water in? So I want to create really dilute urine, I want to get rid of excrete excessive water. That means I'm going to have low sodium chloride that, uh, so low sodium chloride that's going to leave in the urine. It's going to be a lot of water, not a lot of sodium chloride. We're going to call this dilute urine or water filled urine. So why might I need to create dilute urine. When you consume water or other beverages that contain water, that water is absorbed through the gut into the bloodstream and that increases the water content inside of the blood, which elevates blood pressure. <laughs> well, first it's going to increase blood volume. So if I have more blood volume, if I have a higher water content in my blood, I'm going to have higher volume, leads to a higher overall blood pressure. And the result here of that higher volume is I end up with more water than is needed. So I've just overshot the homeostatic uh, set point for blood volume. What happens physiologically if I have too much water in my bloodstream? Well, you create a scenario where we could push large quantities of water into our cells. And those large, uh, quantity, the large quantity of water pushed into a cell can cause that cell to swell, that sw cell, swelling cell, as the cell swells, it can lead towards damage. The cell can rupture or it can burst, burst apart. So that's not a very that's not a very good situation to be in. So we want to try to prevent that. So we need to get rid of some water. So through our glomerular filtration, we're going to have fluid enter into the glomerulus. It's going to pass from the glomerulus, containing a high quantity of water and other solutes. Um, it is going to move into proximal convoluted tubule. Once it's in the convoluted tubule, we're going to have sodium that leaches out. That sodium as it leaches out from the <coughs> proximal convoluted tubule is going to create a salty kidney. Water is going to exhibit no movement in the proximal convoluted tubule. So water remains 
in the proximal convoluted to you. Which ultimately is going to be where I want it, right? I want, I'm trying to get rid of water, so I want to keep as much of that water in the nephron as possible. Sodium leaves. Sodium leaves from the proximal convoluted tubule, making the kidney more salty. So already thinking back to everything that happens there, I've created a water concentration gradient that's actually going to favor the movement of water back into the kidney. That doesn't really look too good because I'm trying to keep the water in the nephron. But we're going to come back around and it's going to make sense here in just a second. So because of the saltiness of the kidney, on the descending limb side of the nephron loop, water is going to follow that sodium down its concentration gradient that's just been induced, enters into the kidney, and into that tissue of the kidney. Some of that water is going to actually enter into the bloodstream. And you might be thinking, oh no, we're losing that water. We're trying to get water out of the bloodstream. But this is okay, right? Because remember, how many liters of water do we filter through the urine in a 24-hour period? Like 180 liters of water. So I do have to capture, even when I'm trying to get rid of some excess of water, i got to recapture a whole lot of this water. So this is okay that this has happened. So it enters the, the kidney tissue to try to balance out that higher concentration of sodium. Some of it leaks into the bloodstream. This results in a decrease in sodium chloride in both the kidney tissue, as the water enters the kidney tissue, and in the blood, because the water is entering the blood. And when I say blood, I'm talking about the blood that's in the capillary systems in the kidney surrounding the nephron. So I now have reduced sodium chloride in the kidney and the blood. I'm going to have higher sodium chloride, higher saltiness in the tubule. So by the time we get to the bottom of the descending limb of the loop of Henley, I've actually just created a more concentrated urine. I'm now in the opposite direction from where I want to be. I'm trying to create more dilute urine. I'm trying to get rid of water. I've just extracted a bunch of water out of the kidney. Then that urinary filtrate that's really, really salty now, so it's really salty here inside of the, of the nephron, that filtrate makes its way into the ascending limb. And in the ascending limb, because it's so salty, it's being driven out. So it leaves the tubule fluid. Just simply traveling down a concentration gradient from the more concentrated urinary filtrate to the less concentrated tissue of the kidney. Now, what's happening to the urine in the tubule? As sodium chloride leaves, it makes more space for water, so I'm now again creating more dilute urine. So as I come back up on this side, of the ascending limb, remember I said closer to zero means more water, you can see that it's becoming more and more dilute. So more and more water, in fact, even more dilute than the 300 over here. This, this number here on the proximal convoluted tubule side, that number right there is 100. It's 300 over here, so it's even more dilute. We're actually containing even more water. So hey, we're actually going in the right direction that we want to go. So, in the distal convoluted tubule,
right here, what's actually going to happen is even more sodium chloride enters the tissue and enters the blood in those capillaries surrounding the tubules surrounding the nephron. This is happening through that tubular reabsorption. I am actually creating in that distal convoluted tubule a very high concentration gradient for water. Because the water doesn't cross, it's not able to cross through <coughs> the distal convoluted tubule. Sodium chloride leaves the urinary filtrate, leaving water behind. Water becomes more and more concentrated, urine becoming more and more dilute. So the water doesn't cross. Remember that what began this whole process, you consume a large quantity of water, increases the blood volume. All of this happens in the kidney to create a now very dilute, high water containing urine. And this actually happens regardless of what's happening inside of the blood. So if the blood is concentrated, it does this. If the blood is dilute, it does this. So we create, by the end of the nephron, leading into the collecting duct, every single time we create very, very dilute water heavy containing or heavy water containing urine. So if I want to create dilute urine, I want to just pass this on through. But if I want to create concentrated urine, I gotta extract a whole heck of a lot of water out of this dilute urine that I've just formed. Because of the change in blood volume here in this process of creating the concentrated Urine, I have a high blood pressure signal because of that large pre uh, uh, volume. So I get my high blood pressure signal from my elevated blood volume. And the results of this high pressure signal is to cause release from the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary gland, a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. This is a hormone called ADH, or uh, antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. ADH circulates through the bloodstream. I have my very dilute, high concentration of water per, uh, urine that's been produced. ADH is antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone. I'm sorry. I, it, let me, let me step back because I think I said that it's going to be released. It's actually not. I have a down arrow drop there. That down arrow means that it's it's not going to be released. I'm preventing the release of antidiuretic hormone. When I need to pee a lot, I have low ADH. When I need to not pee a lot, I'm going to have high ADH. What antidiuretic hormone does is it actually decreases the permeability of the collecting duct, this part of urine production. It prevents water from being able to cross those cells and those membranes. So water remains in the collecting duct and doesn't leach back into the kidney. So low antidiuretic hormone, decreases the permeability of the collecting duct, and the result means that we're going to have water that gets trapped and remains in the fluid in the tubule system inside of the collecting duct. Okay? So kind of the, the end result here the urine that was created contains a high amount of water as it enters into the collecting duct. It has a low amount 
of sodium chloride, low amount of ions. Water cannot leave the collecting duct because it cannot leave the collecting duct we a high level of water, low amount of sodium chloride and other ions. And this results in the production of dilute urine. In the CD or collecting. That's probably about out of time here today. Yes. So we will pick up with um, how we produce the uh, dilute urine, how we conserve water on 